Okay, Sheila Nelson, our guest here awesome. for today. Hi, everybody. Lovely to see all of your faces. Um, so I'm Sheila Nelson. I'm the program manager for the Adolescent Health and Injury and Suicide Prevention Program at Maine CDC. So uh, as you can guess, it's a little bit of a, a long job title. We have a number of different things that fall under our program, but one of the things that does fall under the work that we do is that um, our program is responsible for overseeing, in collaboration with DOE, the administration of the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. So quick show of hands, is there anybody who has never heard of the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey? Perfect, that's awesome. So everybody at least heard the word initials before, you probably heard us call it MIAS. I call it MIAS, people pronounce the acronym slightly differently. I have some people call it MIAS, like I don't know, there's a lot of, I say MIAS, potato, potato, you call it whatever you want. Nihas uh, is the other one I hear a lot. Nihas, yes, which sounds sort of like a cowboy up version of the survey, but I'm cool either way. So let me just, I'm gonna share a screen here real quick and then I will get us going. So hold on just a second. Oh, come on. Right. Hmm, there we go. Okay, all right, so. First question, can folks see the big version of my slides? Thumbs up, okay, all right, I'm already ahead of things. So um, so let me just take those of you, I know everyone said it's not completely unfamiliar for, but let me take a half a minute and just mention a little bit about what the survey is and what it does. So the MIAS has been administered in Maine since 2009, so it's good. It's been around for a little while, and so I'm not surprised that most of you at least heard of it before. Um, and it is essentially Maine's comprehensive youth risk and behavior survey, health risk behavior survey that is um, administered every two years in odd numbered years. Um, we ask about a lot of things and we can talk a little bit more about that too. Um, and we ask a lot of students. So there are several different versions of the survey that are for different sort of age groupings of students. So we have a survey for students in fifth and sixth grade, we have a middle school survey, and we have a high school survey. And um, we have usually, you know, well over 50 to 70,000 students who participate in the survey every year. Um, for the middle and high school surveys, we invite every public and quasi-public school in the state to participate. So come one, come all, the more schools and the more students who participate, the better the data actually is. That said, let me pause for a minute because if some of you are being like, hey, I'm so confused, why are we talking about the 2021 data? Aren't we in the middle of administering the 2023 Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey right now? You are not wrong. Um, we had a little glitch. Normally what happens is we administer the survey in, um, the protocols like to call it the spring of the odd numbered year, which is a load of hooey. We administer it February, March. No one on God's green earth can tell me that that constitutes spring in the state of Maine, but whatever. So we administer it usually, essentially in the middle of the school year, you know, at the beginning of that odd numbered year. So, that said, in 2021, um, like many other states in the country, um, we ended up postponing the administration of our survey because of COVID, right? Like there was so much going on in the 2020, 2021 school year. We had a lot of schools that were not operating in person very much. We just didn't really feel like the survey was gonna be fair or representative. So we actually pushed administration for 2021 to October, November, December of that year. So considerably later than we would normally be administering it that, you know, at the beginning of that following school year. And then we decided that not, well, and then, and then we wanted to get back on our regular schedule. So under normal circumstances, we would administer the data, we'd spend the multiple months it takes, you know, sort of analyzing the data, which is, you know, kind of a complicated back end progress process. And so we do that, we'd release it, we'd spend some time thinking about it, and then we'd gear up for the next survey administration. This year, 
we released the survey data, and then literally we sent out our first recruitment emails the day after. So um, our heads have been on fire here for about 12 to 16 months, which has been a lot. So you are correct that, that this is kind of coming closer to like the data from last administration and the administration of the new survey much closer together than we would normally be seeing. On the other hand, we're going to get 2023 data pretty, you know, relatively close to when we're looking at this 2021 data. So we're going to be able to see some, you know, kind of back to back trends here pretty quickly. So that's just so you all know, that's part of why things are maybe seem a little bit wonky this year. Um, that website, I totally encourage you to go and check out our, our data. So all of the data from the survey is online. Um, we have a very large state level data, you know, report. And then we also have state, we have data by um, the county and public health district. Last time around, we had a couple of public health districts and counties where we didn't have enough participation. We weren't able to release those reports. Um, but we still have a lot of data, you know, broken down by a lot of levels. The other major selling point for those of you that are working in school systems is that if your school participated in the survey and you had more than a handful of students, right? Like we have some small schools where there's so few students that they don't really get their own report because there's too few kids. But if you were a decent sized school, you can get your own data for your school and your school district. It's not for every single question on the survey, but it's for a lot of them. And um, it's great because you can really look like, not just like what is going on in my county, but like what is going on in my school district. The data for your schools and your school districts is password protected. You guys are the only ones who can access it. So somebody in your school or school district, usually your principal, sometimes an assistant superintendent or somebody is the holder of the password for your data reports. Um, if you need, you don't know who that one is or someone like that, or you need to get a reset, um, I, can, I can tell you who that person is who can help you out. But I really encourage you, if you guys participate and you don't look at your local data, you are, you are doing a lot of work and you're missing out on like one of the really key, awesome rewards that you get for the work that you put into participation. So I encourage you if you haven't spent some time looking at it to hop right on and go ahead and do that. Questions about the survey itself before I go, just plowing right into some, some data that we saw from the last administration cycle. Sheila, I was just sharing in the chat that curriculum coordinators or curriculum directors are the others that might be holding. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And we are outstandingly grateful that like the, the ability of this survey to work really rests on the local Mayas like coordinators in each school that is administering the survey. And um, y'all do a ton of work. And many of the local coordinators are school nurses, health and PE teachers, curriculum coordinators, like, you know, like, they're all of you guys because you get asked to do everything. And so um, this is one of those things that you all get to at, get asked to do a million times on top of all of the other million things that you're asked to do. Um, and we could not we could not do this without you. And we do really, really appreciate it. As I mentioned, there are a lot of questions in this survey that ask about a lot of things. Um, I encourage you if you wanna spend time with that statewide level data, like control F, or whatever it is in the PDF is your friend, right? Because otherwise you're scrolling through like 700 pages of data, it can be a little mind numbing. I'm only gonna really go into a few of the very high level things that we saw in 2021. Um, again, just really just skipping across the surface of it. Stop me if you have any questions or if you're curious about things that I'm not talking about, I'm happy to bring that up too. So, yeah, folks can just raise their hand or yeah, you know, politely interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, you're not going to throw me off. So we ask about a lot of demographics for students. Um, one of the things, like, so we ask about race, ethnicity, um, language spoken home. Like, we ask about a bunch of stuff. One of the questions that we, well, two quest sets of questions that we ask students about. So we ask students about their sexual orientation and their gender identity, two separate questions on the survey. Um, 
for many years, we've been kind of frustrated with the way that the question related to sexual orientation is worded. And I will say, some of the questions on the surveys are ones over which we have complete control and we can make up the wording however we want. Some of them, we kind of get told how the question should be by our good friends at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I can talk about the difference at some point if people care, but so that's why we can't always make the questions be the way that they want, we want them to be. So for many years, the sexual orientation question had just essentially four answer options, um, heterosexual, gay or lesbian, bisexual or other. <laughs> and we had a couple problems there, right? One, um, the language that young people use to describe their sexual orientation has changed a lot over the years, right? Some of those words don't resonate as well for young people as I think they may have resonated for those of us, you know, who were a generation or two older. The other thing is we didn't know what that other category meant, right? We didn't know if that meant you're questioning your sexual orientation. Uh, we didn't know if it meant I know exactly, you know, who I am, but I don't really love your words, so I'm going to pick other. Or I don't know what your question means. Totally also a legitimate thing. Um, so we just never loved that. So the good news is in 2021, we were able, they, USCDC let us kind of get a little bit more wiggle room with this question. And so they expanded the category options. So they were still heterosexual, gay or lesbian, bisexual. I describe my sexuality in some other way. That was an answer option. Uh, I am questioning my sexual orientation and I don't know what your question is asking. I don't know what this question means. That gives us a lot more depth, <laughs> as you can imagine. Not surprisingly, as a result, we had many more students who felt like they were sort of better included in that question. So you can sort of see from 2019 to 2021, we actually now have, you know, one in five, slightly over that, even a little bit more over that if we were to include into that pie chart students who say they're questioning their sexual orientation, um, students who are identifying essentially as something other than heterosexual. Um, and then we saw a similar sort of, you know, significant increase for us in the number of students who identify as transgender. Um, and again, this is just students who say, yes, I am transgender. It's not students who say I am questioning my gender identity, which is an answer option. So the other thing I'll just say is like, um, I'm just going to give you the high school data just because otherwise, again, it gets big. So I'm just going to talk about high school, but we do have middle school data on some of these things, not everything. So. Um, so again, I bring this up just because I think it's really important because it gives us, again, a better representation of who we're talking to, especially when we're talking about, you know, topics that come up in health education or, or PE. Super relevant here. I mean, relevant everywhere, particularly relevant here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to let folks know <clears throat> that basically everything that you cover is available, a version of it at the middle school level as well as the high school level. Yeah, so um, a couple things we have not asked about um, gender identity traditionally in middle school. We've changed that. So that will be nice. We're going to be seeing more of that. So that's great. So I will say some of the questions that you see for high school are not exactly the same as they are for middle school. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, but m most of these data points are also available for middle school as well. Um, go ahead and move on. So I have tried really hard to start with the, the good news from 2021, right? Like it was a hard, hard period of time for all of us. So it's nice to think that there may have been some silver lining. Um, so one of the things that I think many of us were concerned about was, right, like what was happening for students around safety, like while they're not at school with us and we're not seeing what's going on for them. Um, the good news is, is that um, we didn't see huge increases in students' reports of violence. Um, I think many of us were concerned about family violence because there's a lot of family stress in the world. And um, we didn't necessarily see a huge uptick in that, <laughs> which was good. Um, we saw a decrease in bullying. 
I'm not sure if that's because we like did great bullying prevention or it's just this question asks about students being bullied at school and students weren't really in school quite as much to get bullied. Um, good news though is at least for uh, high school students, we didn't see a corresponding increase in electronic forms of bullying. So that was good. Um, and then we still have a lot of students, pretty high percentage of students reporting that they felt safe at school. We don't ask them to describe what safe means. That can mean emotionally, physically safe, however you want, they want to define it. But we still have a lot of students reporting that they saw school as a safe place, even if they weren't there as much. Um, the substance use data is also certainly something that we keep a pretty close eye on. This data is one where 2021, I think we saw more kind of COVID related complications in this data um, than in the few other places on the survey. So again, overall good news, we've been seeing substance use among young people trending down year over year as, it's, as we've been seeing it since the inception of the survey. That said, we saw a pretty steep pop down between 2019 and 2021, a little steeper than we would have expected had it just been a matter of normal trend. And so the thing about, you know, surveys like this is you can never say with 100% certainty why something is happening, um, right? Like there's many factors that can be going into data changes. That said, if I had to sort of make an informed, you know, kind of guess at this, I do think this is a place where um, this is probably somewhat that um, a lot of substance use behavior among young people tends to be social, right? They're doing it with their friends, right? They're hanging out with each other. And, uh, you know, we isolated them from one another for a year. <laughs> so I don't personally recommend that as a prevention strategy, right? Like it's not actually great for young people in other ways. Like, so I know none of us are advocating locking young people in a basement to keep them away from substances. That said, the sort of the like twist that I've given when I give this part of the talk is that I think it is a really good reminder of why it's so important that we encourage young people to be social, right? We encourage them to have those good, strong developmental relationships but we encourage them to do it in environments where they reduce access to these substances, right? Where as adults, we're reducing access to substances in their world and we're encouraging opportunities for them to connect that don't involve, you know, many of, many of these substances that we don't want them using at this age. So that's just, uh, I think in 2023, if we see these kind of start to pop back up a little bit, we're not going to think that that's because we're doing a bad job. I think it's just going to be we're kind of coming back to a little bit of a normal, more normal place than we may have been in 2021. Um, uh, 2019, vaping was a pretty hot topic. Um, and so just so folks also know, you know, this was e-cigarette use. Again, we saw another pop down. Um, I think some of this is COVID. This might be a place where I do actually think that we we scored some wins with real prevention, right? Like 2021, like 2019 was like, we were just, it was like getting smacked in the face with, with this one. So much was happening. There was a lot of really intensely predatory marketing to young people around these products um, in so many really deeply creepy ways. It took us a little while to catch up with some of our public policy responses, things like restricting many of the flavored products that were so blatantly targeting young people, restricting marketing, doing a lot of the things that we needed to do. I am really hopeful that for these, that we are actually going to be able to sustain a, a decrease in, in, in vapor product use among young people. We'll see, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to stay optimistic here. Questions about any of that data? The substance use related data. I would I would be curious if <clears throat> if any of the teachers have observed a yeah. same trend. Now that you have young people back in front of you again. Anybody want to jump on that one? Um we've seen a an uptick mm. in the kids vaping. Yeah. Um, like in blatantly vaping, like oh, a real blatant uh, not even trying to be sneaky about it. Mm. Type of, we were just talking about it in our meeting the other day. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think we I don't think we've won here by any stretch of the imagination, but um yeah. So I think there's a, I think there's a lot of room here to continue to improve. Um, again, I'm hopeful, but I also this is one of those things where like, as often as the case, every time we in public health think we're like trying to stamp down a fire, it like pops up somewhere else, right? And so many of these companies are unfortunately highly motivated to um, market these products to children and make sure that children are using them in a way that's going to sustain them as tobacco product consumers for many years to come, which is obviously the thing we're trying to prevent. And I think uh, marketing through um, online marketing, yeah, you know, being able marketing, to make those purchases. Yeah, influencer marketing, all that crap. Sorry. Yeah. I and Michelle was, the end of the day. Michelle was saying she's seeing it a lot in the sixth grade. Yeah. 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 I would yeah. say I would say at the at the high school too in Portland and Daring, um there's there's an uptick. There were always like trying to stamp it out but um yeah their kids are talking a lot about vaping and how they're getting away with it and sneaky and blah 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 so <laughs> yeah yeah and again i think i think this is just going to have to become part of the new narrative of prevention that we do right which is again you know not not unsurprising and talking about how many are not doing it <laughs> right again i am still hoping that you know maybe we again will be successful in having kind of taken off some young people like as usually happens when you make a you know when you do some of those like policy and environmental change practices that make some of these things a little harder to get a hold of for young people right you're gonna potentially kind of your 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 first want you know win prevention wins are going to be with young people who are just not going to be motivated to seek these products out if you make it a little bit harder right so that's good, right? We want to get those kids out of there. And then we want to start working on those young people for whom, you know, these substances are, they're using them for more complex reasons, right? Very often for, you know, things that they're doing to kind of help them manage, um, you know, challenges, mental health challenges, social challenges in their lives, right? Or they're being provided by adults to kids, which is something that we also see not infrequently. Questions about this? This is another one too, just where for those of you, because I have a little extra time and I can talk about it. For those of you who are working in schools, you know, when vaping first started becoming a really big issue in schools in 2019, um, uh, we saw a lot of like kind of, uh, uh, kind of punitive responses to young people, right? Like some, some more stuff around like zero tolerance, first time offense suspensions, things like that. Again, you know, just to sort of be reiterating our messaging from CDC around this, which is that, um, you know, these are addictive products that are being marketed to children who do not necessarily under fully understand that those are addictive products and that once you start using them, it's very hard to stop, right? And so for students who are, you know, bringing these products into school, potentially being sort of you know, kind of caught in violation of, of, you know, policies at school, we continue to really recommend that this is a treatment issue for young people, right? That this is an issue around getting young people connected to supports and services, um, rather than necessarily seeing it as exclusively a discipline issue. I can talk about that more at some point. Uh, so that was the good news. <laughs> This is the less good news. Um, and certainly from you know the, the programmatic work that I do, something that we're particularly concerned about, right? Which is data related to mental health. Um, so we ask students, again, this is self-report data for students. Um, we ask students questions around um, essentially depressive symptoms. We don't use the word depression, but we basically ask if the students felt sad or hopeless for two or more weeks so much so that they stopped doing normal activity. So there's like an interfering with function part of the question. And then we ask about that for high school students, whether that happened one or more times in the past 12 months. Um, and then we ask students about seriously considering suicide in the past 12 months. And then we ask about, you know, one or more suicide attempts. I do want to say one of the challenges for the survey, and it's going to be hard with figuring out how to like make questions that work, 
we don't have good questions on the survey about things like anxiety, stress, other forms of mental health struggles that we know young people are really wrestling with just because like, it's not just Maine. Nobody's come up with a really good way to get a question that gets at it. So anyway, just throwing that out there because we're always open to suggestions for this. Um, you know, but we sort of have kind of used these three questions as our sort of like uh, leading indicators for lack of a better term. And, you know, they haven't been going in the right direction for a while now. So I think, you know, there was a lot of concern about mental health during COVID, understandably. Um, and we did see things get worse for young people here, right? Between 2019 and 2021, the message we've been trying to send, <laughs> things were getting worse before COVID, right? I don't know about you all, you know, I had some folks who like suddenly discovered youth mental health during COVID. And I was like, oh, shockingly, it's been a thing for a while. But welcome, welcome to the party, my friend, even if you're a little bit late. We actually saw an even steeper increase between 2017 and 2019, right? So some stuff has not been going well for young people here for a while now. But, you know, again, super important that we have this conversation. COVID didn't help, you know, that much. So we did see significant increases around depressive symptoms. We saw significant increases around suicidality. Um, we did not see significant increases in suicide attempts. That's gonna be actually not as nice in a minute when I show you some more stuff. So one of the things that we do for all of the questions that we answer, and this is why the statewide survey, survey report is so long, is that we break out every single question by all of those demographic things we ask about. We break it out by age and we break it out by geography. We break everything out, right? So we really can dig into that data and see which students are particularly being affected, right? Because not sometimes if you just take that first number, it doesn't necessarily show you the full story. This is one of those places where I think I'm starting to realize as I talk about this data that it's really important that we don't just leave it at this, right? Because there's some things happening underneath this data that is really critical for us to talk about. And then, and so this is the big one. So I do want to acknowledge, this is another one of those questions that the CDC kind of forces us to ask in a specific way that we wish they didn't, right? They do ask us to uh, identify, students have a question early on in the data in the survey about whether or not they identify as male or female. They have. CDC has not given us permission to give students a non-binary option. We've asked them for that multiple times. We're still pushing. It's not great, right? Um, we're glad we give students a chance to like more fully identify themselves a little bit later with some of the, the gender identity questions. And I don't know, like, and I would never make a claim about whether or not all of these students are necessarily identifying their sex assigned at birth, right? I just say, this is how students chose to identify their gender on a binary question because these were the only options offered to them. So caveat there. Even as such though, um, one of the really astounding takeaways that we've been seeing, which we have seen for quite some time, but has just got a thousand times more stark during 20, 2019 to 2021, is that female identified students by and large are driving the sort of mental health crisis in Maine for this data, at least as it relates to these three data points. Um, not to say that, that, that male identified students um, are not experiencing problems, they, they certainly are, but when you look at the rate of change and you look at the gap right here, it is astounding, right? So you are now talking basically twice as many girls, almost half of girls reporting at least one serious depressive episode in the past 12 months. And that's at least one. So it could be 10. <laughs> um, uh, a quarter of girls reporting that they seriously consider suicide in the past year. And remember when I said that like, we didn't see a significant increase in suicide attempts that is only because uh, attempts among boys went down significantly between 2019 and 2021. Uh, that increase for girls was in fact significant between 2019 and 2021. 
So um, this data is hard, frankly. I just, I mean, like I look at it, it's hard for me to not have a lot of feelings about it. Um, it is being borne out in other data sources that we see and other surveillance data sources around attempts that show up in emergency departments. We saw a very dramatic increase among girls, especially younger girls, um, during sort of the COVID window. So it's not just the self-report data. It's actually we're seeing in other places too. She only had a comment in the chat yes. box about social media and the impact. What do we think about how social media is impacting this data? Yeah, right. So this is again, this is one of those places where like, I would love to hear people's thoughts because I have a couple of thoughts. I do think it's something in here, right? Again, this is one of those places where again, I wish I could, I wish I knew all of the why, right? And you can't always get all of the why out of here. So something's happening. And also, right, like, what is the thing? Because we have other questions in the survey about like, the amount of time that young people spend on social media and boys and girls are not actually that different they're roughly the same amount which is by which i mean all the time <laughs> like, you know like it's not they are all spending all of the time on social media not a shocker right but there's not that big a difference um so something's different in the either in the way that girls are using social media, the way that social media is using girls, right? The reaction to what they're seeing, like something, there's some complication in the nuance here, right? Because it's clearly not just about exposure, amount of time. And we know we're not going to get social media back into a bottle, right? We can't really put it back away. So it's, this is one of the places where I would love to know, like, I would love to be hearing from young people what is the difference experience that they're having, right? Like, how is this affecting them? Like, what is the nuance here? And, and how could we think about what we need to do to be protective of girls? Because yeah, it might be, but it's clearly not just as simple as if young, if girls are on social media less, it's going to be better because I don't know that we know that. So I don't know if other people have thoughts about it. Just unmute if you have a comment. Yeah, feel free. I mean, again, this is a, one of those places where like, uh, there is no wrong answer here, really. Well, I um, had one. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, by the way. And I think what you're saying makes sense, but I think it's also kind of how do they, because they were self-reporting on how much time they spend on social media. And I did an um, activity with my advanced health class students. and they were like where they went into their phones and the breakdown of how much time they were actually spending. And for some of them, they're like, oh my gosh, I don't, I can't believe it. Like that's all that came out of their mouths to start. And I'm like, can't believe what? And they're like, how much time I actually spent on this social media or on that. And I think that sometimes what they perceive as how much time they're spending versus how much time they actually are, as well as those number of pickups. Every mm -hmm. time you go to look for a notification, did somebody message me? Maybe it's the lack of connection yeah. with that social media piece. Um, or, oh, I put myself out there and nobody responded. And yeah. so some of that perception of how that impacts them, not even just the amount of time that they're spending um and yeah that's like a really that. interesting but that is a really interesting point i bet i'm not i think you're probably right you know um because i do think that there might again some of it's time but some of it might also be again like what what they're using it for for lack of a better term so i don't know if anybody else wants to other thoughts about it too rachel, yeah sorry rachel i saw a hand go up go ahead rachel are you unmuting rachel if I can do it for you. Does that help? There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just wondering, like, when then we think about the data, do you think of like, like how many females and males were born in that time that this data is coming? Like, was there more females born that you're pulling data from or? So this is of the, so it's like 40, 
8% of girls and 23% of boys. So the, the data I will say when we look at the survey is actually roughly half and half. So we don't necessarily have more girls than boys in the sample, but we actually, you know, we sort of, it's because it's not necessarily among all students, right? Like, so it's a percentage of the number of girls and a percentage of the number of boys. So it, it doesn't necessarily reflect a huge differential in the number of kids represented in each of those buckets. It was a great question, Rachel. Yeah, question. yeah no, it's, it's one of those we always wonder too, right? Like, is there something going on different here? And I will say one of the other things that the reason I sort of mention it is that I, it is also somewhat true that what we do know is that um, overall girls are more likely to report depressive symptoms in general. And because, like I said, we don't have great questions about some other forms of mental health distress. It may be that like boys are experiencing their mental health challenges more as anxiety or they're experiencing them more as something else. So again, that's why I don't want to ever say no boys have anything wrong with them. I would never, ever say that, right? Because there's probably some complication to this data that we're not able to pick up. But like I said, we are seeing some other confirming and concerning trends here. So it is, I think, a real difference that we are seeing. I think another impact on the, the mental health is the timing of when they are on social media right. as well. Um, yeah. Because, you know, being on social media into the night and in the middle of the night impacts their overall health. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of these places where it's like, we we need good we need better science than is available to us right now right like because the why right like we're not going to get that just from this kind of data we're going to get it from people who go out and like do studies and research and ask young people right because they're the ones who know and um, i don't can i just say one yeah. thing mm -hmm. i think from a parenting view um, there's not a lot of censorship going on as far as what your um, child can access and um, having apps and stuff like that at a very young age. So um, this education is far beyond the school. You know, yeah. it really needs to reach the parents who are allowing full access. Yeah, I think that it, you know, it feels super overwhelming. Like, again, this is one of those places like, this is why I want us to, somebody again, to go out and really dig in about like, what is the, because again, I don't have kids, but those are, my peers who do, this is super overwhelming for parents, right? It just feels like, like they don't, you know, this is a brand new world. Like people my age didn't grow up with this stuff when we were teenagers. And so we're trying to parent kids essentially like on another planet, right? And parents and families need some help here, frankly, in terms of like what they can do other than just saying no, which I don't think has worked great for families historically. Yeah, I was also thinking too, I've, I'm just curious about, I know that a lot of them look at different social media influencers. Mm -hmm. I wonder if those influencers that are more geared toward female identified folks are more, there's a more emphasis place on, you know, body image and looks and physical you know, beauty standards and all that stuff. Whereas maybe right. males are looking at like sports and music and, you know, so, I mean, I, it's something I'm curious about. Oh yeah, me too, for sure, right? Like, cause misogyny lives in here in a lot of places. Like I, if I had to take a wild guess, right? In terms of how the messages that we send to girls and women and that we send to them a very early age, which is, you know, not for nothing. So we can come back to this. I I said I was like, oh, I might not need an hour. That was a lie. I knew I was going to talk the whole time. So, um, so but I want to plow through the last couple of things and then maybe hopefully have a little bit of more time. So this is the other sort of major health disparity that I want to point out here. And it's again partially why I want to sort of show you that first slide that you know where we sort of see more and more young people right identifying as LGBT younger and younger right. So in high school, in middle school. Because again, this is a very persistent health disparity of ours. We have not made as much progress and it is affecting more and more and more young people, right? Which is, we see really staggering disparities between um, LGBT identified young people and their um, uh, heterosexual and cisgender peers. So this is sort of on the, on the left side, 
on um, those questions around sexual orientation on the right side, the question around gender identity. So you see around, again, depressive symptoms, close to three times or more um, LGBT young people reporting serious depressive episodes, right? To the point that we're looking at three quarters of trans identified young people. Um, seriously considering suicide, right? Over almost half to over half of young people um, and uh, an actual suicide attempt, right? Looking again, three times the rate for, you know, again, for trans identified young people close to a quarter, right? Which is devastating, frankly, right? Like that is not that is not an acceptable state of emotional health by any stretch of the imagination. So I just want to sort of, again, be laying that out there for folks. So again, and we're talking about who is struggling the most when we look at this data. And Sheila, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but this data is could be trend data, not just 2021. We've you are absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I just tried to show it oh, because- that's a, No, that's okay. It's just, a little wonky, but yeah, out. no. I mean, again, I wish- the disparity hasn't been increasing, but it also hasn't really been getting better, which sucks. Yeah. It's um, and it's not a COVID thing. You know, I would say. Yeah, I want to be really clear about that. Yeah, it was yeah. not a COVID thing. We certainly saw that be something that has been true for us for a while. Sorry, and, go ahead. Christy? And Sarah, Sarah also pointed out oh. that, um, and then Chrissy, uh, that it's, and this is nationwide. It's not just yeah. us. No, not it's just everywhere. us. Yeah, Christy, go ahead. My question was, um, the bullying that actually i think i remember it went down but these are much more increased is there bullying specific um that was overall bullying right that question Correct. yep okay That's if you were going there but but like i said remember what i said all of the questions get broken down so if you were to go in on the the report um, if I were to show you for bullying among LGBT youth as opposed to non-LGBT youth, there'd also be a huge disparity here. So one of the things I always make a point of here is that what we see behind all of this data is that LGBT young people experience far more um, uh, violence and victimization, right? So more bullying more violence and harassment, more family violence, right? Like more of all of those things that we know are risk factors for poor mental health. And then flip side, they also experience less protective stuff, right? So they don't have, they report less positive support from their parents, less positive support from teachers and less positive support from communities. So again, when you think about it, right? Like that's part of what's playing in here, right? Is that, you know, these are young people who are experiencing more stuff that puts them at higher risk for poor mental health and then less <laughs> of the good stuff that might buffer them from developing those mental health challenges. So it is very complicated. And you're right. Yeah, this is we see disparities for LGBT youth in many, many, many of the indicators that we're looking at and not in a good way. So. We have a comment from Rachel. If the youth are using hormones. Could that increase the data? Don't know. Wouldn't necessarily be able to tell from here. Um, we don't ask that as a question for young people. Um, I think one of the things that we are aware of, right, is that potentially as more young people are um, more out, right? Because again, we don't ask a young person, we ask a young person about their identity. We don't necessarily ask a young person about whether or not they've disclosed their identity to anybody else. Anecdotally, like in the work that I do, I see more and more young people disclosing, right, which is a good thing, right? Like, we want that, right? Like, we want young people to be authentically themselves. That's actually a protective factor. The problem becomes if young people are authentically themselves and they are getting targeted for it, if they are getting harassed for it, right, if they're not being supported, then that could increase their risk. It's not because they're being authentic. I want to be really clear about that, right? Like, and I have to always try and really be really clear about this. I never share this data to say that I don't think young people should self-identify at an early age. They should. They get to be themselves, right? What we as adults need to do is to make sure that we're doing what we need to do for them, right? And so that's the point to say, again, if young people are more likely to be out, they may also be more potentially likely to be getting, you know, experiencing sort of compounded risk factors in a way that isn't great for their mental health sustainably. Sorry, Jake, go ahead. 
Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, this I'm seeing it in the schools um, that where I don't think particularly trans and non-binary kids are not feeling safe. Uh -huh. And there is a lot of bullying harassment and there's not a whole lot of support for it either. And I, as an openly trans teacher, have like been harassed right. and um, they see that too. They see yeah. that too, and they feel the effects, and they're like, "Wow, this school isn't safe." Um, right. So I think this has less to do with hormones and a heck of a lot more to do with the treatment of these students. Yeah. It's horrible. It is horrible, and this is why. And here we go. This is why I'm leaving teaching because yeah. I'm tired of being targeted and harassed and called a hishi and a f and b and you know all that other stuff. And I'm like, nope. And my administration does not support me. So it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah. And we need to do, but we need to do better with this population. We need to do a heck of a lot better. Yeah, I would agree. Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to add to that at all too. Sorry. I'll... Well, I mean, only is that, you know, the, the violence of how we name and gender children and students and, you know, this, the conversations that happen in educational spaces around adults complaining about, well, they changed their name again and like, it must be a thing and they're figuring out who they are and we are not having and holding our colleagues um, responsible for the violence that is being perpetrated upon children. And it is, it, it's, I mean, I, I sit as a, not as a DOE person, but I sit in equity meetings in school districts and we talk about whether or not it's considered harmful behavior when we misgender and we dead name children. And ad adults fundamentally don't believe that it is. And they just don't. And so that's a message that is on us to spread to our right adult colleagues, the incredible violence that when we do not see children for whom they are with assets, this is what this, this to me is the impact of this. So that's, and so through that SEL lens, if anyone wants to have some of those conversations and talk about how to do that and talk about resources to begin those conversations with adults and with children, reach out. Cause the other part is kids get this. We talk about kids harassing each other, but yeah. so much of the time kids get this and it's an elementary school, my, my, my own children's friends right, I, I, are, are openly owning who they are. And so it, this, is, this is all the way down to elementary school and we're just not allowing the children, students to have the conversations because they, they generally get it. They are so much more supportive of each other overall than the adults who are privileged to be able to teach and keep them safe. And the, and the, and the adults that have brought this up through and continue to hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, like I, I mean, so many things. This could be another presentation, which I'm happy. I think to we could today. have another conversation about. Yeah, this. Like, oh, I, I, I know I could. Um, and the uh, and and you know, again, for me, there are lots of things here, right? Like I work in suicide prevention, and so I, you know, I mean, do we need to do these things because we're right? They're right. Yes doesn't even really, but on the bottom line, we, we know that honoring and respecting people for who they are and identifying and supporting them as they need to be identified and supported rowers are risks. All right. Like that doesn't like, it has a, it's not just cause it's a good thing, right. It's a, it's actually the thing that they need in order to keep themselves safe and healthy. And as I often also point out, right. Like, um, young people don't have choices here, right. Like I'm an adult, right. Like I have a lot of choice to some extent in where I go and who I choose to spend time with and who, you know, and, and how I uh, um, expect other people to respect me and treat me, right? Like young people don't have those choices. We tell them they have to go to school. And the idea that we force children into a situation every single day in which they may be actively unsafe, right? This, this data should not be a surprise to anyone as much as it is also really emotionally challenging. Yeah. So let me just pull to the last one and then we can kind of come back because I can, yeah, feel free to talk while I go to the uh, next Rachel, one. Well, Rachel, Rachel had a comment right. that, oh, before yeah. we move on. Rachel, you want to chime in? Can't see her. Hold on. I can see if she's coming in. <laughs> Sorry, there I can't go. see everybody in the queue. Right. Sorry. Sorry. Nope. Yeah. 
so like I was I'd just been like reading here and there those articles of like that book that was on the shelf at one of those schools and like how much of an upriot it was and people quitting and stuff and it's like that's what you're leading for an example to children and then wonder why they're scared at school and stuff like that so just a little comment yeah oh yeah I have lots and lots of thoughts here (laughs) (laughs) and Sarah was talking about the outside the influence on our kids in our state from outside entities yeah exactly right Um, Right. young people are more connected now than they ever were so you know like I mean, it's fortunate in that we have fewer of these laws that are actually on the books, but as I was having this conversation earlier today, right, like, um, you don't actually have to set a fire if you just yell fire in a crowded movie theater, right? Like, we know that even having these debates about whether or not young people have the right to exist is going to negatively impact their, their, their ability to be okay in the world. So anyway, um, so so other quick thing, because the, I do want to say that the other thing that the survey does ask about is the good stuff, right? It's the protective stuff. So I don't ever want to, you know, I always want to draw attention to that because usually we just focus on the behavior stuff sometimes right away. So um, these were, this was a little bit of a mixed bag in 2021. So I'm kind of hoping that we see a bounce back in 2023. Um, we had a decrease, a significant decrease in the number of young people who said they had a teacher who cared and supported, cared about them and supported them. I I think this one may just also have been a bit of a like, it was really hard for young people to form those caring connections over Zoom, right? Like, I I think there was not much we could do here. So I am hoping this one kind of comes back up. Um, And I also think, Sheila, that I also think the teachers were coming back into the school, not necessarily being able to give the supports that they had given in the past oh yeah because we were like kids were like we were getting sent home every other week like it was reals like a lot of stuff was happening when we were doing this we still saw a decent amount of family support which is great um that's good the one that was a little bit of a bummer to me (laughs) was we saw kind of a big hit here around again connections to caring adults other than parents and that's a really critical risk i mean protective factor for young people and um Again, some of this may have been COVID, right? Like young people not having access to, you know, extracurriculars or community events or like their best friend's mom, you know, right? Like all of those other adults that kind of were around them. So I'm hoping this comes back up, but we saw kind of a, a, a dip here between 2017 and 2019. So it's not just COVID. So I think we're concerned about this one as well. And looking at this as a place where, again, like we want to prevent the bad stuff. But a lot of the things we we know we can do stuff about this, right? Like we can build the protective stuff and know that over time, it's gonna have that ability to support young people, right? And keep them, you know, and to sort of help us kind of turn the tide in some of these areas that we know we're seeing some some not such great trends. So, sorry, like I said, I, I should have known I would just keep talking. So I don't know if, I know we're at time, but I don't know if anybody else has any last minute thoughts. I don't want to hold you for too long. Rachel, I see your hand up, but also I don't know if anybody else does too. Uh, I was just wondering how these questions like were worded because like, what if they're foster kids? Like how do like someone in foster care see these questions? Yeah, so I should say again, I shortened the question language because I have to make it all, we do parents or guardians for most of these. So it's not just parents. Right. And we don't necessarily say, like, if we ask about family support, we don't necessarily say your family means your parents, like to, to family, you know, like, so there's, so yeah, they're, they're more inclusive than they are worded on this slide. So other question thoughts? Again, if your school is participating in Mayas 2023, we are so grateful um, and are looking forward to seeing this data um, in a deep way and hoping again, you know, that we're seeing some good stuff and that it keeps telling us where we need to be doing better. Because there's certainly some places where we we could be doing better. So sorry, Sarah, I see your actual physical hand. Go for it. Well, I just I I really appreciate the lens because when I was when I was pouring through this data, I saw the um, gender and sexual identification, the piece that we didn't get to today is the racial piece. And so with that racial literacy and the and then the intersection of race 
and gender and sexual identification cannot be yeah. overestimated. And so I, I super appreciate this lens, but I just think bringing up the intersectionality of that piece is really important. So thanks for letting me say that. Yes, no, absolutely. And like I said, like this is where I, I wish I had five hours, right? Because like there's a, so much in the data that I didn't get to, I can't even tell you. So that's why I'm sort of encouraging folks to do two things. One is to go on and look at the statewide data because the statewide data has the biggest number of kids in the bucket. And so you can often get this sort of most nuanced portrait of who is being impacted the most. So that's one piece I would really encourage you to all to look at. And also to go and look at your data specifically for your schools. And I bring that up um, because very specifically in 2021, we sometimes have to do some methodological shenanigans to make sure different questions show up on the school specific surveys. So the uh, data reports, right? Because I don't, you probably uh, don't care, but regardless, um, we actually sort of rearranged some things on the survey to make sure that um, this in 2021, all schools had, um, or at least all high schools and middle schools too, I believe, um, had questions on their uh, providing uh, information about students' self-reported experiences, particularly of harassment based on their race and ethnicity. So that is in there. Um, the 2023 question will have, 2023 survey will have a little bit more of a nuanced sort of series of questions, which we're actually really excited about, um, but for sure, there should be some really rich data at the school level as well. We wanted to make sure that that was represented for data again, so that, you know, schools who were telling us that it wasn't an issue for them didn't necessarily, uh, <laughs> couldn't necessarily say that it was just because they didn't have any data about it. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I think you would enjoy having a conversation one on one with Sheila about yeah, please. <laughs> yep. Any data. questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, again, like I said, there's a lot here and it's really rich. Um, and again, I'm a data nerd, I talk about it a lot. Um, so if you want to be a data nerd with me, just track me down. Susan knows how to reach me at any time. And the question about can parents access this? This is only the 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 general right. data is on the website, which um, is available to all. And right. but the administration gets the raw data and chooses how to share that out. Am I correct, right. Sheila? It's not even that they get the raw data. So all of the data reports for the state, county, and public health district are all publicly available. So anybody could look at those. The data reports for your specific school. Only you guys can get those. Only the person who has the, you know, the password can get it. Now, some schools choose to share those reports with parents. We definitely say that you certainly could, um, but that's a choice. Um, so, you know, for sure. Um, oh, freedom of information. We've never run across that. Uh, we have some stipulations that probably would maybe allow for a little bit more protection, but yeah, I guess maybe if a, a school wanted that, uh, parents wanted a school level report, they could maybe, I guess. Um, thankfully, we've not run across that past. The actual student data is all completely anonymous. So we don't provide any data. We do not collect data from students that would allow those students to be identified. So if a parent said, I want to see my kids' responses, no way, no how, right? Parents have the option of with, of opting their child out of the survey. That is a parental consent option we give them, but they cannot see their child's responses if their child chooses to participate, ever. There's no way, literally not a way for them to do it. And I'm just sharing on the screen, sharing yeah. what the website looks like. So um, folks definitely wanna go and peruse and dig through. You can see where the school sign in, in is. And again, that's when you wanna talk to your administration about how to get into your local data. Um, it's very important to curriculum development. So check that out. They've done a great job with the website. Lots of resources and tools. Stephanie? I was just going to like comment on what you said earlier um, about like not giving parents the school specific and the freedom of information. I think because 
depending on where you are, some individuals who identify as certain specific race um, and things like that, some of that data might be more easily identifiable. And I think that that would be a reason why a school would be allowed personally. I don't know from the administration standpoint or the legal standpoint, although it's given anonymously, somebody, anybody could say whatever they want. Um, we're hoping they're being honest. And there are some schools with such small populations of different races and ethnicities and um, identifications and things like that, that I think that we have to be aware that that could be a potential risk is that so you're exactly right and so i just want to add another extra layer of like uh comfort in this regard so you are correct but also maine cdc has very specific rules about identify potential identifiability that's not a word i don't know what word i'm looking for here but like of data even if the data is technically anonymous so what that means is if we have a report for a school or the statewide data for that matter where the number of young people falls below a certain threshold right so if there are too few young people in that category we do what's called we suppress the data so we won't release it so we do that as an extra layer of protection for the possibility that someone might be like oh there's two kids like two kids in my school said that they you know i don't know what sniff glue right i know it's so and so and so and so we we will never release a serve a size that small because we are we do not want to let people we want to to the extent that we possibly can keep people from sort of working back to violate students potential confidentiality so that's just another level of things that we are very cautious about when we release the data to schools yes well, Sheila, I want to thank you from the group for being here and sharing. Oh, thank, you thank you for today. staying 10 extra minutes with me. Yeah, um, I, I feel free to reach back out if you have any questions yeah. at all. Don't hesitate. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll be coming back to you here with new data pretty soon. And that's it. And again, encouraging folks to take that survey for 2023 as much as possible, even going back and asking your district, yeah. are you signed yeah. up? Are we doing this? Um, yeah, absolutely. Not too late. Too. We could get yeah. you back in. You're not. So yeah. All right. All right. Take care, thanks. everyone. Sheila, I'm going to just stop the recording now. Awesome. Take care, everyone. All right. Thanks. And if anybody has any additional questions,